So welcome everyone. We are very, very excited to have you all here and we're looking forward to a very engaging and exciting session. So let's start. Michael? So good morning everyone and thanks for having us. Um, to be a moderator for this esteemed panel is my honor this morning. And just in case anybody, I know Lisa introduced and you all and said you all already know who we are. I just want to just let you all know that we run a, a small organization by the, by the name of Fashion Focus. We are a dual channel platform that helps to develop young designers and creatives and, you know, more or less facilitate business, right? We are specifically focused on trying to match designers with retail opportunities because not everyone has the vision of Candice Bacchus. And I think that what she's doing at her establishment is something that if the entire industry was to take an example from, we would have a much more, a much more sustainable sector, right? So with that being said, oh, sorry, I said it was a dual channel and we also have a magazine. I'm very sorry that I didn't bring enough copies for everybody this morning, but we'll try to distribute as many as we can when the session is done, right? So this morning, um, we're going to go through a couple of topics that will assist you in your development, regardless of where you are in the process, because information is always valuable, right? There are some of you that now, may now be getting started, some of you are more established, and then some of you are ready to do big business. The insights that this panel will give, as I said, I'm sure that it will help you in creating perspective and um, very, very good guidance along the way. So I have a couple of questions that I'll pose to the panel, and I'll invite the other panelists to chime in if it is you see relevant or you want to add something to embellish an answer. For the audience, I'd ask if it is we make notes, and then we can take a couple of questions when the discussion has concluded, right? So our first question is for... Mr. Richard Young. Now, what we know, what we've been discussing so far, would be a lot of micro factors in terms of your design process. So what do you do, your tech packs, your cutting, your, how, how do you perfect a garment? What we're going to talk about now are factors in your, in your macro environment, things like your brand, the industry, doing business on a local, regional, and international scale. Now, as um, Lisa said, you all know Mr. Richard Young and his very colorful tenure in the fashion industry. So our first question this morning will be for Mr. Young, and it simply is, what is the existing perception of Caribbean fashion, not only from, you know, on a peer level, but maybe a regional and international level? What is the, what is the existing perception of Caribbean fashion? Well, I've been working this industry for a while, and um, it was very incremental in understanding what fashion is. I can't thread a needle. I can tell you what looks good. I can tell you how to present it. And I work with a number of designers in the region. I'm very proud to see that I have, well, in a way, spearheaded a thought that there is a Caribbean style, a trademark, um, that is evolving because it's not completely defined. Um, and it is in keeping with all of the other trademarks like French style and Italian style and German style. But what I think has been lacking is the fortifying of a philosophy that we come under. And that umbrella perspective has to be what I have been calling the Caribbean aesthetic. Now, this, this Caribbean aesthetic is not just about fashion. It's about the whole creative arts. And there have always been movements of creative endeavors centuries old. And they always had to be branded. And they always had to be exponents of the philosophy. And they always had to be guided. Um, not everybody believes in it. But as long as you are in the Caribbean, geographically, you're a Caribbean designer. And I think in an interesting way, you are mandated to serve that, which allows us to have unique perspectives and to add to the template internationally. 
you know, so that we're not just making clothes. We're not just covering naked people. We're not just opening magazines and doing a polka dot dress like what we see in the, in, on our page. We are inscribing our Caribbeanness when we do a garment. And when we do anything in the creative sector, the methodology um, has to be informed with usness. And we need to rally around that perspective and mobilize it. Not all of the designers understand, accept, or are willing to be part of this Caribbean movement. But I feel that branding internationally, for us to be taken seriously, has to come under that, that perspective. Um, because we are fragmented in the region, and insularly, we are not going to be formidable. So that the Caribbean perspective has to influence how we shape what we do, color how we see ourselves, um, how we costume ourselves. Because I see fashion under the, the, the um, rubric of costuming and selling our way of, uh, of, of presenting ourselves to the world. So designers are in a transitory stage of them saying, yes, I'm a Caribbean designer, and I am doing Caribbean-influenced work. We have an eclectic, myriad, cosmopolitan reference to apply to our creative endeavor because of our history, because of our socioeconomic situation, because of our post-colonial situation that um, we are evolving. So I would say that the, the, the designers are part of a movement, some of them openly and explicitly, others not as intentionally, but that's the only way I think that the world would see us in a serious light by branding ourselves with this innovative perspective this unique way of channeling our energies, which would make us have cutting edge competitive advantage, if done well, you know? And therefore, that's how I see the movement of Caribbean fashion, to make it export worthy. We have to appreciate that and apply it unapologetically. Okay. Um, so then, I think the major, the major point is in identifying what is this Caribbean aesthetic and how do we pay homage to it rather than veer away from it, right? So then how does a fashion designer that clearly is still evolving now differentiate a product, our products, from those that already exist? And then second part would be, and then what elements of Caribbean lifestyle do we actually draw from? Because we, what you, what you said was, is extremely relevant about post-colonialism. When you see Caribbean fashion or Caribbean aesthetic depicted in the media, you know, you see they always throw us up as Hawaiian shirts and khaki pants, right? How do we as designers or as this movement how do we differentiate and how do we now draw on, you know, what elements do we draw on to really create that, that, that brand? In all our ways of doing things, we have to rely on our own biographies to shape it. The person who grew up in a village where they had to fill water by the standpipe, they see life in a different way. They communed at the standpipe and they spoke their life stories and their anecdotes. And the Caribbean people are anecdotal people. We shouldn't shy away from it. No, we just need to transpose this anecdotal existence onto what we do. And we have references because we are so um, syncretic. We have so many influences. We have Arab, Indo, African. There are so many mutations. We are a fusion, fusion society. So you could have grown up next door to some Hindu people, 
and those influences on what their, the threads in their garments, in their Indo-Caribbean style, sometimes you are not aware that it has influenced you. You know, when, when, I, when, when I did a project called Fashion Week 3, I said Costel becomes couture, and we use magenta as the color. And I had Dr. Muhammad come in and talk about coolie pink and green. And no longer must we see them in ugly terms. The, 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 the way we want to do it, when the Calypsonian wore a gold shirt back in the 50s, and they thought it was Costel and ugly, is the evolution of us claiming that we have a style because we came out of this mixed potpourri. And that is what I think we need to brandish to the world. Um, as long as it's refined, as long as it's distilled, as long as it's uses, as Sandra pointed out, all of the fundamentals of good design and good manufacture, that's how we have to go forward. But it has to be shaped by this reference to our architecture or art or culture, you know, the way we associate with each other, how we confront our realities in this part of the world is different. It's not, it is very special, this plural space that we live in. And we need to utilize that to inform all of what we do with an intelligent perspective. And that's, that's really what I have offered to the fashion fraternity. Let's be intelligent in the way we promote and the way we, we, we market what we do and brand ourselves. So I hope I've covered the, the areas you have said there. The references and what you have to look towards are right around you. The flora, the fauna, the history, the geography, the associational links between each other, the, the, the multi-ethnic, the multi-religious space we're in, there are influences everywhere, you know? And you pick on it by the color, the balance, the proportion, the silhouettes, and design. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. So the next question, I'll go to Ms. Jamelia Alexander. Much of what Richard has said talked about history, talked about context, talked about owning where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going, right? How much of that designers are actually aware of, we're not sure. Because not everyone is in tune to history. Not everyone is aware of what happened, or how we've, we've come to be here, right? However, this powers our story. It is important to our story. So then the question then is, how does research, right, which is something we, we, we can't say all of our creatives do, right, how important is research to the design process? And further than the design process, in terms of your production process, in terms of trends, forecasts, color selections, because Richard just spoke about color as well. How important are these things and how does it either allow you to match your products to a market or make it difficult for you to match your products to a market, really? Then, you know, what are the, some of the things to consider? Um, thank you very much. Uh, research. Is, is not one fold, it's not a singular layer of gathering information. It, is, it also doesn't only include gathering information, it's deciphering the information and understanding the reference of the information to what you're trying to achieve. We have a situation, of course, where we do not understand our aesthetic and we can't articulate it. Part of the reason why is because we don't understand our aesthetic, we don't really know our history and how our different cultures integrate and what that means uh, as it relates to the design process. We also need to articulate our individual brand stories. So it's, it's not easy to tell a story that you don't know. It's not easy to articulate something that you don't understand. 
and beyond understanding it, putting it in context for your consumer and your buyer. Research includes, of course, understanding our collective history. It also includes understanding how your brand could fit into that history and how you can carve your niche by probably looking at some of your potential competitors or brands that you're in synergy with. And it also includes, it's very imperative that you research your target market. Your target market is not just your consumer, your consumer is the end user or the customer is the person who purchases on behalf of the consumer or may be the consumer themselves, but also understanding your buyer. Your buyer is the gatekeeper of your market. They are the ones that get the products into the hands of the consumer. So it's imperative that you understand your buyer, their culture, the languages that they understand, not just in their physical languages, but what do they communicate as quality? What do they communicate as or understand as relevant to their market? Doing that level of research, identifying it, creating a proper profile, and using that profile as your Bible. So research, but also the application of what you learned is very, very important. And doing that is painstaking, yes. Once you've gathered the information, of course, you need to put the information in context. Mind mapping is one way of doing that. Really fleshing out your ideas and carrying them to the ends of almost infinity so that you have a very complex and textured brand story to present season after season. And also allowing your brand story to be relevant to a wider market. We as designers and as Caribbean brands don't only appeal to a US or European market because they probably appreciate our, our rich ethnic aesthetic. We also appeal to uh, markets in Asia beyond Japan, of course, that understands aesthetic and they really adapt to different aesthetics. But in Southeast Asia, in Singapore and so on, that they could connect with our way of life, our climate, our, our fusion of culture, our understanding of ethnicity. So it's really going far and wide. And once you've gathered that information, putting it in context, your brand, and really mapping out the thoughts and the processes to the point that you have a textured and, and layered brand story. Thanks. One of, one of the important things that you mentioned there would be the importance of research. And you said something in terms of determining who is your competitor, right? Now, I'm not aware, but there is a difference between slow and fast fashion. What, let me contextualize. When I say I'm not aware, not I'm not aware of slow and fast fashion. Um, what I'm saying is, I don't know if these things are being considered in the brand stories or in the efforts of this creative group. Because if you are trying to identify who is your competitor, then it may not necessarily be constructive for you to be comparing yourself with Zara, yeah? Because there are two different things. It's important that we don't compare apples with oranges. So if you can share what are the markers or what are the key performance indicators for persons that have started a journey with slow fashion as their philosophy, and how do you determine when you are, you know, when you are going from one point to the next, as opposed to somebody who's embarked on a different path that may be much more similar to fast fashion. Just the appreciation between those two so people can correctly gauge or benchmark their efforts in a constructive way. As it relates to branding. Yes. Uh, it's important to, to understand where you want your brand to, to go. You know, you want to pretty much determine the trajectory of your brand and go in that direction. And in so doing, identify the factors in that trajectory that affect your brand and not be discouraged or encouraged by factors that don't affect the trajectory of your brand. So as it relates to slow fashion, um, slow fashion and fast fashion as the industry evolves is more an understanding of your price point 
and that's the category of your product, not just the cost. Fast fashion usually fits into a moderate to budget price point. And so the setup and the development for that process is a totally different process from, let's say, a contemporary brand or a higher end designer brand. Um, and so understanding that and understanding how you enter the market as a fast fashion brand is also important. So in, the, in Trinidad and Tobago and in the Caribbean, we are poised to enter the market in the contemporary price point because our fashion one is new. It also, we also use high quality materials and um, our aesthetic lends itself to that contemporary price point. Also our price lends itself to that contemporary price point. My suggestion is always to look at the contemporary avenue which is where the trade shows and so on come in, of course. And you also have a certain level of flexibility with your branding because a contemporary brand could be branded as, as its own, you know, its own entity. It doesn't always follow the rules of all the other um, price points that are predetermined. So because we are entering the market, we are new as an aesthetic, as a movement, and as designers, we're entering the market. Uh, the easiest entry level is the contemporary price point in my, um, in my experience. If you do want to veer into the fast fashion, which is more moderate, there are a lot of other factors you want to consider. You want to consider if you're going to sell to a retailer, if you're, going to, if you're going to then develop your own fast fashion brand, which is going to be akin to Zara and H&M. But as it relates to branding, it all, it's all the same in terms of the elements that you need to, to really be focused on. You need to be focused on, one, what your story is, knowing your story, writing your story, telling your story from a macro and a micro perspective. So from the Caribbean aesthetic and where you fit into the Caribbean aesthetic, not everybody is interested in bright, colorful pieces and not everybody is interested in black and white. So we need to figure out how we bring the aesthetic in as we as we develop our product and we develop our brand story. So knowing your story, one. And two, if you're a contemporary brand in Trinidad and Tobago, you need not fear and you need not try to compete with the moderate brands or the fast fashion brands that are in the stores in terms of price prices specifically. What you should be focused on is developing a product that is high quality and communicating the quality of your product through your brand story. And that's very, very important. If the consumer understands why this costs a little more than that does, you educate them, you communicate that, and you're consistent. So when they purchase, they also feel like they are part of a story that you've told them, you sold them, and you continue to sell. There's a cool factor to contemporary fashion that you cannot deny. And as Caribbean designers, we are poised to really execute that cool factor. So, Communicating um, what, is, what is valuable about your brand, of course, in the quality, of course, in the selection of fabric, of course, in how agile you are in developing product, how relevant your product is to your consumer is very important as a slow fashion, quote-unquote, brand as opposed to a fast fashion brand. If you do want to go into the fast fashion side of, of it, I mean, you are, of course, welcome to, but understand that the factors that affect that are larger scale, marketing and branding efforts, and larger scale production efforts, and selling efforts, more so. Okay, can I just sure. jump in? Sure. Because what Jamelia is saying here is um, reminding me of, I don't know your name, but um, in the denim top, the question you had earlier about the $300 bathing suit, if you should, if you should be pricing your bathing suits to that price point, because you see that's what's going in the market. Um, and when you said it, I was just in the back there being like, no, no, no. Because if you are pricing to a price point, you have to start off with that price point. So similar to what Jamelia is saying about um, fast fashion and um, budget fashion. You are starting with the price point and you're working backward from there. So you have to decide if you're going to price competitively, you start with 300 and then you put the amount of work, the amount, the type of quality of fabric, the quality of your production to make up a $300 price point as well as still get your profit. If you are designing, if you are a designer-led process and your concept and your creativity is what is leading you, you then have to price according to that, which is what, from what you explain what you have been doing. 
um, you would have to change your whole uh, system in order to hit a price point just to be competitive. So stay where you are, as Jamelia said, that contemporary area is what is cool. It's, there's, there's a cachet that comes with that area and you are putting in the work to um, uh, validate it. And so what you need to continue to do is not show why, um, it's to basically show why your piece is worth more than that $300 piece. Why you should be buying that as opposed to the um, lesser quality item. That is, should be the focus instead. Yeah. Let me just jump in for two sure. minutes, right? Sure. So I'm not going to assume you all know who I am, right? But I am one of the directors of Simply Marie. I, we have a retail boutique, right? Um, Jamila touched on a number of things that are pretty relevant, which is making sure you have your research done. As a buyer, I am bored with hearing you coming to tell me this is better quality than this. Now, I haven't done a fashion degree. I don't know how to tread a needle just like Richard. But uh, I'm accustomed shopping internationally. And I have done the research behind what my customers want. So besides you coming to tell me that uh, I'm starting, my starting price is 300 bucks because, you know, this is good quality fabric. To me, what my customers will come back and tell me is, well, what makes it good quality? What makes it different to this item? That's $100 because this is what I can see. This is what I can touch. This is what I can feel, right? So we have stocked 15 designers to date. I only do wholesale purchasing locally. And what we have been selling alongside that quality point is your uniqueness as a designer. What is it about your product besides quality that will make me want to buy it? So I understand quality and stuff is all well and relevant, but I feel like it's time that we move past understanding quality. Everybody wants good goods. Everybody wants stuff that will last forever and at a good price point, right? But uh, what, what has shocked me in the retail landscape recently, having been dealing with all these recession issues, is that I have been struggling to less say, well, this is a real example, huh? To sell a shoe for a hundred dollars, right? We've dropped. We've been. We all. We're always doing customer research. We're always in that um, feedback process where I want to know what's the problem with the customer. Why is it you don't want this? I'm telling you, the, 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 this is imported fabric. This is excellent quality. This is going to last you, you know, how long? This has an added insole, right? They they still want a discount on hundred dollars, right? But uh, I, I just, I met with, um, let me see, one of the first designers we had in store was Anissia Brooks. I'm not sure if you all know her. She's on her fourth collection, going on her fifth collection for us next week. She um, was designing these little crossbody bags. And I knew that my customers love these, the, the crossbody bags became a novelty item then. You know, it was trending a lot and stuff. They love the, the idea of the bags. But what we did was we actually got in touch with our customers and found out, you know, what will make them purchase this product as opposed to this product, right? And they said, you know, the uniqueness of it is what will make them purchase it. Those bags came in at about $450 and ain't nobody asking for a discount. So why in a recession you want a, you want a, a shoe, you want to ask me for a discount for a shoe that's $100, but you're okay with paying $450 for a bag? that probably not going to match everything. It's a unique piece. It's just a nice to have item and you okay shouting out for 50. So I understand quality and handmadeness and, you know, um, your ability to stitch in bi-directional ways or whatever. But your uniqueness as a designer and your understanding of our lifestyle as Caribbean people is what will sell you. So to, to, to um, expound on what, what um, I was saying, or to, to draw attention to what I was saying, quality is not just about material. Quality is also about your ability to tell the story about the uniqueness of your product through your product and through other means, right? So it's not just about, oh my God, my product is high quality. And so I had an example where, um, where I was doing a workshop and one of the participants said, what if I feel like my product is worth $200 uh, or $300. And I said, well, what if Bertie's felt like his pepper sauce was worth $1,000? Or 
And Yuki says, you know what? I put time, effort, and energy. My recipe is, you know, one of the best recipes. Look, I have all these people purchasing my product. It's a thousand dollars. Would you purchase it? And they were like, well, if you put it like that. But I said, no, that it's that absurd if you assume that the quality of your product and even the price of your product to produce your product is the surrogate, the only surrogate for value. That's only in the absence of all information. But we're in a in a market where people have so many options. What is different about your product? And you translate that not only in the quote-unquote telling of the story of quality. Quality is not just about material. It's about a story. When we went to Tokyo, the buyer said, well, tell us the story about the brand. They literally asked us, send us the information about the story. That story, that uniqueness that you're referring to, it's an intangible quality, you know, but just as valuable as the quality of your product. I want to just add there from my experience as well, um, in North America, Toronto, Montreal, Miami, and New York, the story, the story, it's almost like if you have a well-packaged crocus bag item with a fabulous story, the person goes home feeling that you have coursed them through your experience. The, ex the um, experiential quality of the product matters, not just the fit and not just the look, you know, because, and particularly in societies where that, that eclectic thing, like Montreal particularly, you know, they came, why did this person use this material? They're interested in the story. So when the designers weren't there, I had to be versed in selling the story. And they're buying. They weren't talking about what is the price. They want the item because when I present the clothes, I tell a little of the story in the run. So I realize how important the story is. And that's why I have been pushing this Caribbean aesthetic um, ideal because that uniqueness is what I feel we need to be pushing. It's almost like it's, ta it's targeting niche markets. Wherever, as you mentioned, Singaporean, they have a plural society. Um, you go to New Orleans, wherever you have that mixture, the people want to feel they have one of a few. They don't want a mass-produced item. And that is where we are in our evolution as Caribbean style makers. And that is what I think we have to celebrate and constantly reinforce because all of the ones who have that are not a brand my brother's garment, but that is, you know, people see you in the clothes and say, you're from the Caribbean? And you just walk in, not just because of the color, because of the distinctiveness, because of a sense of innovation, a sense of um, trying something new, pushing the envelope, not just making clothes. And that's what I, I have taken up the role in some things of telling the stories because some of the designers don't know. So I do a little interview with them and then I realize you have a fascination with red, you know, and they tell me, well, while they're talking, I had a grandmother and she had roses. She always preoccupied herself with red roses. So now I tell them, I help them impart their story by referencing their biography. Because sometimes, as you see, they can't articulate it. But if you just chat with them, you start to see their references from their life story, you know? And a swing tag in the middle of Iowa that tells a little about Caribbean culture. The person is as proud as punch. Because they still feel that when they buy um, a sarong made in Indonesia, thinking it's Caribbean. They say, I went to the Caribbean and I picked up this fabulous silk sarong in the boutique attached to the hotel, but none of the hotel boutiques have any Caribbean clothes. You know, the Caribbean-like clothes, Caribbean-styled clothes, but not made by Caribbean people, you know? And that's where one of the directions I, I also think that has to happen. Intra-regionality in the push of the Caribbean product is first and foremost not going into Mayfields, you know, the competition is, 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 is vast, as, as was mentioned by the other panelists. So you need to find these niche spaces and, and, and push your, your export there, because interregionality is very important to development of the Caribbean aesthetic. Exactly. Now, I'm, I'm going to be devil's advocate a little bit here, because what we are hearing is it is very important to tell your story 
and embrace who we are as Caribbean people. On the other hand, we, we are labeled sometimes as a very xenocentric people. You love everything international, and you don't have an appreciation or care for anything local. So understand that what we, are, what we have to forge is a cultural change, a behavior change, an embracing of what I am and where I am from is important. It is what defines me. A lot of designers do a fast five-minute copycat of what they see abroad and, you know, this is European and that is whatever and this is what makes me a designer. What we are hearing here is a little bit of the opposite. And I want us to appreciate the context because a lot I've heard in our business, I like to hear when designers are giving their when they're talking about their audiences and who it is they're selling to, they love to say, well, I'm not really too concerned with local. I shoot in international, right? I want to have that international market. Now, I'm not saying don't be ambitious. What I'm thinking is you need to win at home first. You perfect your, you know, your methods, and then you can, you know, you, you can progress. However, what the panel, and this is to Jamelia Robert, this is really an open question. Tell us about, and I think you started telling us about it already, but what actually, what actually in your travels to Tokyo, your travels to North America, Richard, you know, just give them that, that assurance that this is what is going to distinguish them from everything else that is out here out there, you know, as an option, really and truly, as our Caribbean is? It's a, it's a fine balance of standing out and still fitting in when you go into the international market. You want to fit in for all the right reasons, but you want to stand out for all the right reasons. So let me explain. You want to fit in and you want, when you arrive at a trade show, you look like you're supposed to be there. You look like your booth is set up in a way that you're supposed to be there. But beyond all of that, your product is branded in a way that, that, you know, warrants you being there. Your product is branded in that particular way. Um, also, the representation of your idea and your aesthetic, your personal aesthetic or your brand aesthetic, is very, very important because once they are attracted to the booth, they want to see product as buyers. Um, consumers, once they're attracted to your product, they want to understand what that product means to them and how it's going to add value to their lives. So it's, it's important to fit in in that way, but it all, it's also important to stand out. Also, fitting in alludes to product that is of a similar, a similar quality, but also on trend. We can't deny the need for being on trend. A lot of, sometimes our local designers kind of shy away from that because that process is sometimes, you know, a long-winded one and it may seem as if it's, it's difficult to be able to connect with the trends, but it's important to see the trends as a guideline and not the Bible and understand that you then need to take the trends and, and interpret it based on your aesthetic and, of course, based on your Caribbean aesthetic, but definitely based on your brand aesthetic, right? And so interpreting those trends and pushing it back out. When you look at the runways internationally, you see designers, you see the trends across the board, but you see totally different aesthetics and products available. But there's one underlying thread of trend. That is what makes the product relevant to the buyer and to, to the consumer, right? Um, also, it's important to, to stand out in terms of your story, your branding, the same reasons why you want to fit in, you want to stand out. Your story, your branding, the way that you present your brand, your color selection, very important. How do you make your product relevant to the market, but still interesting and representing your own um, brand? That's very important. Also, having a continuous story, not just the story that you're telling, of course, but carrying the story all the way through, from the product all the way through, branding the product in particular ways, something interesting like, um, like, your print, 
the the materials that you use, the embellishments, the details, and so on. That's important. But how does that then translate into your hang tags, into your labels? Are you going to have a really beautiful garment with uh, a satin label with a screen print on it? How does that carry the story all the way forward? Right? It, it doesn't, essentially. So you want to ensure that your hang tags, your labels, your merchandising, the way that you present your products is, is part of your branding. You want to ensure that that meets a particular standard, but it's unique. Yes, you also want to, to look at the actual product that the, or, or merchandise that the buyer goes away with. You don't go into a trade show and not have something for the buyer to go away with. Even if it's a, a non-moving bag, one of those, those non-moving bags that you get at the, you buy at Pilo or you get at the supermarket or at some of these stores, buyers actually came to our booth for the bags and purchased because of, because of it. They want something to go away with. I have been a buyer as well as I've sold two buyers. So I know when I go to a trade show, I mean, a lot of it I wouldn't really use, but I going forward, but I will look at it at least the first two days after the trade show, decide what's relevant, because I wouldn't remember all the brands, right? So how do you tell the story of your product? So they see, okay, this is a complimentary card or a bag or a pen or a group of items from this particular brand, and they remember, oh, this is the product. Ensure that you, you, you have a lookbook, line sheet, and so on. But that is also branded with your brand, your company's brand, but also the brand of your collection for the season, right? So that should also follow your brand. If your brand has a particular aesthetic, you want it to follow through in your collections. So you want to stand out and you want to fit in, but you want to be remembered more than anything else. And giving a, a gift and so on, giving merchandise and so is one way to do that. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to add too, because the trade show is critical. Sometimes people fail to re recognize the importance of the fashion show and they see it in an entertaining way. And even if we use entertaining methods to win you, it's all about merchandising. Um, on one example, for Pan American Games, I was fortunate to do a project which was a fashion extravaganza of Caribbean designers, and we carried eight designers. Those people sitting in the audience, they are buyers in their own way. And if you allow them, because what we made show and do is to, right after the show, allow the convergence of the public there to come to the, to the designer. Purchases are made on hand, orders are placed, because in the storytelling, the few words that I would have scripted, the type of music used, I have to course you through an experience per designer so that you can record in your brain, whether it's the full flare skirts had an Indocentric tone. There is a memory, because Jamila just said a memorable experience. I have to make you remember the independent ways the Caribbean is seen in one show and give each person their highest value in the run. And, and those designers can tell you they have had follow-up sales and they have had, they had immediate sales. And we only didn't bring Caribbean people. It was in Toronto. There were other people who were fascinated at a Caribbean show, won a bid in the Pan Am Games. And so therefore you had this, this convergence of people who are cultural buffs just interested in in, in the difference and the diversity. So we had a packed show and the result was sale. And then, well, you must be ready, as Jamelia say, so that you get into their pocketbook and you get into their handbag and you reach home in the house and when they throw it out, your brand falls out and they read the story two days later and say, wow. And they remember the music, you know? And I am a big Beyonce fan. But it really can have a Beyonce song playing loud when you're showing um, a Caribbean brand and the models want to lip sync the song going down the runway, you know? You know, and I find I go to shows and all the music is foreign. And I must commend Caribbean Export Development Agency. One of the mandates, if they're helping fund something, I couldn't believe I saw it in fine print. If you're doing a fashion show, you of necessity must use Caribbean music. We have such a 
wide genre of music coming from the Caribbean. French influence, fusion music, Indo, jazz, Afro. We could find ways of expressing ourselves to impact on people. So not only the sale, the sale of the whole culture, the creative aspect, the music selling, everything selling. You know, so we have to do that. We have to impose it on ourselves. Because we come out of a culture, as our moderator Michael said just now, we want to just go the international brand. You know? It's not because it's better, because that's just what it is. Songs, you're more in trend. you more when you go to the full school metropolitan space, you, you dress like them and you're cool. You know? So we have to do this process, and it's an evolution. It's not all formulated. But if the designers of coming, moving forward, start, you know, making their work pregnant with these possibilities of difference, where there's a little threading that they picked up from a, an Afro collage art method, whether it is uh, something from the, the Arab world, because they are a lot more jeweled and pretty and sheer fabrics, and you apply it but have the story to tell. You know, I, I so. agree. Um, what I would um, what I would like to allude to is the fact that whether it be a fashion show, whether it be a trade show, or buyers meeting, you go uh, to the buyer or you are part of some showroom that's smaller. The essence is having some some form of local presence in the market, some form of presence in the local market. That's the market that you are trying to attract or you're trying to penetrate. Uh, that may be, of course, connecting through the internet, cold calling, and so on. But when you do make that connection, when you do uh, connect with the buyer in that market, when you are at the trade show, at the fashion show, at the buyer's meeting, ensure that when you leave, you get their brand in your hand. That they leave, you leave them with your brand, or they leave with your brand or representation of your brand in their hand. If they don't leave a product, of course, the aim is for them to leave a product, but you want them to leave with your brand and an understanding of the tangible and intangible qualities of your brand and what makes your brand special, what makes your brand sellable, and what makes your brand viable. Okay, so... Uh, just mm -hmm. to comment, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that, you know, the goal eventually, or your goal currently is to be able to export internationally, regionally, right? But I totally agree with Michael when he says that, you know, we need to start home and make sure that we believe the brand. So my question to you all is, why is it that I'm not wearing your brand? According to Jamila, first of all, I probably only know five people, and that's people in the panel, right? And I do a lot of research in terms of trying to find designers. So your brand, you should want to know why Why doesn't everybody know about your brand? Why, how, why, why are you not getting it out there? What is stopping you? Um, little things that we do in, in at Simply Runway to understand, you know, gaps in the process in terms of why your brand is not out there and stuff, is just getting to know your neighbor, your sister, your brother, the man down the street. Why doesn't he wear your brand? What is it about that they don't like? In other words, embrace the haters. Local people are the first people to crash down. We are going local, we are supporting local, them too, overpriced, blah, blah, blah. And majority of the time it's because they don't understand your brand. If they understand your story, like Richard said, like for me, I always fall in love with some designer and selling the story in the store. And the uniqueness that comes out of the brand and the story is what usually gets the local, and in, in more recent times, selling faster than the imports. So we need to start home and try and wow our neighbors and our community. And I was talking to Michael privately a couple months ago, and I was like, you know, I have stepped into the reality of the designer rather than requesting that you step into my reality as the buyer. Why I did that is because I need to understand who you are. I need to understand what it is you're selling and why you're doing this thing to trust you, right? Now, just an extension of that conversation was, you know, it, after doing that research and getting to understand the designers and where they want to go with this, I started pitching it to random people who don't know anything about local fashion. My husband was probably the first person to go, no, 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 we didn't want nothing local in the store because it's untrusted, 
right? Everyone's familiar with H&M and Forever 21 and whoever and whoever and Trini's fast to buy the international rather than local because they know about the international. They trust it. They've tried it. They know it works. So I was talking to Michael and I was saying, you know, it's more than just presenting a product to be purchased. We actually need to start by changing the consciousness of our people to accept local. But that responsibility is not theirs as the consumer to accept. It's your responsibility as the designer to come and tell me why I must trust you. Why must I spend? And I, I, and I really am. Um, I spent a lot of time understanding price points with the designers. Every designer I go to, if it's a top 750, if it's a dress 1500, always across the board, or there's a very small margin between those prices. So I started asking them to break it down for me. Tell me, what is this? What is this? What is this? Why is it 750? And I went and I did my own research. I know you're buying from Jimmy Abood and Party Fair and whoever and whoever. I know if I hired you, you're important from so and so and so. So I would go back and I would track it back. It's very easy to know, okay, how much you paid for this fabric, how much time you spent on creating this based on the delivery times that you gave me, right? So there's a lot of different statistics on Martin Paul, but the point is I was able to come back at values that didn't match what you was telling me that I should pay. And in other words, it caused me to not trust the design. <coughs> Understand my point? So if I'm, after I do all this research, I'm saying, okay, your cost, your actual cost is coming up to 300, right? <coughs> I totally respect everyone's blood and sweat going into this thing, right? But to say we're going from 300 to 750, as an investor, I can't understand why it has to be 750. And why I'm not agreeing with it is because the customer doesn't want to pay the 750. So me as the buyer, I'm not going to get no sales. You understand? So while I might take the product for you at 300 and trust that you're saying it will sell to 750, after doing my research, it does not sell for 750. Now, of course, that will be subjective to the designers that meet my aesthetics that I have been working with, right? I'm not saying that your item for 750 may not sell. I'm just saying the probability in the retail market recently of a top sound for 750 is very, very rare at this point, considering our existing recession, recession, um, recession situation. And not because it's expensive, but because the customer knows what they can get in comparison to what you are selling. If it's a jacket, if it's a shirt, it's a top, they know they can get something that looks equally nice, made very similarly for cheaper. So my point is, it's important that we get people to trust the local. You have to be trustworthy. Your brand has to be strong. Your brand has to be real and true to what you're saying. So you can't shop in a trade show like Jamila saying and be unprepared to answer questions like, what does your brand stand for? You know, how long does it take for you to, um, to produce? Where are you producing? Who have you sold to? Who are your buyers currently? How many products do you get sold a month? And be unprepared to answer those things. You have no one. Um, you have no research done in terms of your sales, no research done in terms of, you know, if you're following the trends. And when I say trends, that's pretty subjective. I know, I know we are very internationally influenced as Trinis being bombarded by all this media. But we have our local trends in Trinidad, if I want to get as discreet as that, where at my store, we don't follow spring, summer, autumn, winter. You know, we follow carnival, Easter, grad, um, then we have August holidays and there's Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we don't know where I'm saying that. We're looking at what, when we jam in, what we're doing, you know? And then in the middle of all that, we have work. So, you know, how are we going to change the mindset of the Trini? I'm just talking about the Trini here before we even reach Caribbean. To just believe that what I'm sowing and what I'm giving you is worth it. Right. It's worth it. All right, so let me... Yeah, that, that, is, that is very, very valuable context. So let me just ask one more question, and then we'll open up the floor in the interest of time. And the question, therefore, will be to Catherine, right? We have spoken a lot about how you prepare yourself, and a lot of it is end result. We, we are talking about what to do when you get here, and X, and Y, and Z. And sometimes a lot of what happens is that a lot of entrepreneurs, because it's not just about being a designer anymore, this is about creating a business, right? A lot of entrepreneurs are not sure where they start. 
and some are brave and they might go and seek out financing and they might do a business plan and they might do all these different things. But we also know that a lot of what happens is that it starts small. You kind of tinker with a couple of things and you realize you're getting some traction and then it turns into something else, right? So in light of the concept of startup businesses, how do you, how are you able to be strategic and economical and using tools that might be social media otherwise, you know, these type of things to really get that story started? How do you get that story started and get that communication started? Because what we're realizing is that the biggest problem is awareness. We just don't know about it. Agreed. Um, so obviously different things work for different people, but from my own experience in building my own brand, I have a cosmetics brand. It's still very small itself. But from my own experience, I tend to be up with Jamelia where it's um, fit in and stand out at the same time. And so I personally, I need to know what other brands, they may have more money, they may have more social media followers, but I still need to know what they are doing at all times so that I know what I should be aiming to do. And then I can start figuring out how I can do that on my limited budget, with my small amount of followers um, and in my space. Um, lately, for particularly for social media, for fashion and beauty, I see the term is influencer marketing. I see a lot of influencer marketing happening. And this is, in my opinion, on the grand scheme of things, a billboard is thousands of dollars per month. An influencer marketing campaign can be extremely relatively inexpensive where you target people who you, you don't have the following, but they do. And um, even the Fashion Focus has a great article about blogging. We have bloggers who may not have a million followers themselves, but within our markets, there are influencers who have the right. People are looking to them to tell them where, who are the local designers, where are they selling, what are the items that I'm looking for um, in accessories, in fashion, in beauty. Um, and I have an experience, like, I'm not an influencer, but I have a personal experience of my own where I happen to have a particular, I was on a trip with a particular travel group and they had a market and I had on in a picture that they took of me and put up on their page. Um, it's not local, it's regional, a J Jolly, who is a Jamaican designer, a J Jolly captain and who orders, once they put up that picture, who orders that week? for that particular item went through the roof. She told me that day that she could not, she could not stop answering emails. And it's not to say that I, as I said, I have a particular following. She doesn't have the following, but you're looking to see where you can make those synergies and where you can make those connections and social media is free. These, these people, these influencers, they want to make these connections with designers because they want to look on their Instagram and their Facebook that they have an unlimited wardrobe. And so the only cost to you is the cost of making and sending a garment to them or making and sending an item to them that they could potentially wear and then expand your own following through that. It's definitely, definitely worth it. So that is an area particularly that I am interested in. And I'm not going to go into too much more, but it's just looking at what the other people who you want to, what standard you want to reach, what they are doing and trying to figure out how to adapt that and interpret that in your own space. Okay, um, I had one more, one more type of um, contextualization, which would be, and I think it would kind of like be for Candice, but she may have already, she may have already explained it, which is the awareness for the, as designers to realize that the process is twofold sometimes because your conversation and your pitch to a buyer and a conversation and a pitch to a consumer is two different things. So one is a business to business and you know in other corporate circles they just um, shorten it as B2B. That is a different conversation from a B2C conversation where a retailer just is making a decision whether or not they're gonna purchase a product or not, right? So maybe in the questions we can kind of touch on it if it's relevant. 
But at this point in time, I'm thinking for time, we're okay now to open the floor for questions that you may have to extract information that will be very valuable to your operation right now to any or all members of the panel. My question is with respect to something both Mr. Young as well as Ms. Candice said. With respect to, you said the consciousness, when you spoke of the consciousness, but I'm looking at, isn't the consciousness on that of the designer as well? Because most of the designers, when you ask a designer, what do they deem success to be? They always say international. But my thing is, why can't success be Caribbean dominance? To the point where we can have international buyers come in here to our markets. So my question is, why isn't Caribbean market as respected as the international market? Candice, can I just, can I just chime in very quickly? <laughs> We're talking about Caribbean markets, right? Okay, so your question is, why do they identify success with that international scale and why it can't even be at least Caribbean? Well, my segue to that is, why can't it be local? Because we have 1.3 million people, 1.4 by the last consensus, right? People here, everybody in that 1.4 million with a small variance wears something every day, right? If we were to do research right now as the percentage of those people that were locally made garments i'm sure we would get less than 10 percent so why isn't it even that the measure is not how many people in my neighborhood wear my clothes before you even talk about my city a, a, a borough and even we be talking about an island right and this is where it comes back to the markers Catherine made a very modest statement, and she said she has a small business, right? However, when I walk in Super Farm, I see her stuff on the shelf. So, I don't know, is that small, or isn't that success? <coughs> Super Farm. Yeah. Kappa, right? Uh, if I would, I just want to say one <laughs> thing. Say one, one thing. Yeah, sure. Do not exclude the local market. That could never be the conversation. That should never be the conversation. Absolutely not. You just treat the local market as a market and treat it with the same respect that you would treat the international market. That is the, that is the takeaway. Because you would never be able to understand how your product is accepted if you don't see how it's accepted in the, in the immediate environment. Why spend money to try to market internationally when you could gather that data, get those sales, connect with your own people in your own area? Right? So it's very important that when you identify your markets, you identify the local market as a market. But there is value in looking to the international market. And the value is, as well as the local market, the value is a larger market <laughs> internationally. One other thing. We cannot oversimplify the process of creating a product and pricing a product effectively. It is a very complex process. So when you look at the cost of labor, especially in Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm saying this and then I'm going to respond to it as devil's advocate. When you look at the, the cost of labor, when you look at the overall costs and so on, they are very different to a manufacturing country's cost of labor. And so if a designer or a smaller manufacturer is producing a product, it is going to be a bit more expensive. But as a designer, you also have to be responsible and create a product that fits into the market and fits into the buyer's budget or they would not be able to purchase the product. And of course, price your product for wholesale and not price your product for retail when you are selling to a buyer. Because as Michael was saying, when you sell to a buyer or you converse with a buyer, you have, it's a totally different conversation. It's a logistical conversation. It's a conversation about relevance, about volume, and so forth and so forth. So it's important to, one, look at the local market as a very important market, right? But understand the factors that affect you operating in the local market. And two, do not exclude necessarily the international market or see it as Nirvana. It is just another market that you need to position yourself for. Um, I just want to kind of come back to your question about consciousness, the designer being conscious of their brand and the product, right? Um, 
having spent a lot of time sitting down one on one with designers, there are a lot of social issues that affect the designer that are not public. Right? There are a lot of intimate issues, strategic, strategic issues, financial issues, and stuff that the designers burden by. So, with that said, that designer who is compromised in my mind is now in a setting in Trinidad where our mindset is oil and gas. So you're coming to your parents, and this is a real example I'm going to give you. One of my very good customers, she never spends less than about 2500 every time she comes, right? Her daughter is very inspired by fashion and wants to pursue fashion. But her mother said to her, no, there's no money in Latin Trinidad. There's no value in Latin Trinidad. So budding designers as well as emerging and existing designers have a compromised conscience i realized in terms of pitching fashion to the community right they already feel inferior they already feel like they're doing something that's questionable now they're the designers who ain't nobody no care about all of that they know what they're doing this thing and they're confident but a lot of them secretly have compromised consciousness or well, a compromised conscience, and it has become difficult for them to express their story, according to Richard. Some of them don't even know their story because of that social pressure in the community. So, to me, it's our responsibility as trainees and as locals to help people in the creative sector, and not just say, okay, well, well in this case, let's say a parent, the girl's parent, you know, there's no money in that, or there's no, you know, fun in this, there's no relevance in it. We need to kind of guide our community to respect and understand our creative sector. And I feel like once a designer is not, uh, doesn't have that much social pressure, they will be able to communicate their product and go and meet whoever. They'll have the confidence to go and do their degree, they'll have the confidence to go to the trade show and stuff once there's support by the, from the community. Because what I've realized is a lot of my customers, they don't know anything about local. They don't even know where to shop local. Frankly, there's hardly any places to go and find local, right? But when they come into the store, they will ask me personally, why do I shop local, right? And my response is always that, you know, when I was in high school, I would say I was an average student. I studied environmental science and natural, uh, natural resource management, and I did another degree in geography, right? And... Uh, you know, I worked in my field for about five years. I did well and stuff, but it wasn't fulfilling for me, right? And I got married pretty young, at like 23. Uh, well, I got married at 22, and we started a business at 23 because we had our personal goals. We knew what we wanted for ourselves, right? So coming from, let's say, average academics, I would say that I've grown, that we've grown Simply Runway on pure passion. Now, the thing is, we opened eight years ago, which was during a recession time also. And the pressure on us to not do this business was huge. My parents was like, totally, hell no, you are 23 years old. What do you know about investing and buying this and doing that and whatever, right? So my own parents were like, you know, I don't really see this as viable for you at this point. But my husband and I, we drew from each other and our confidence was able to have us you know, have me at 31 now, basically doing what I want. At 31, I don't have to answer to anyone. And, you know, I was strong enough to build my own confidence and to feed off of my customers. So once I put the product in the store now, I would have my customers telling me, okay, I like this, I do like this, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I would tweak my products. Now, understand, it's not tweaking the brand, eh? I'm tweaking the product. The brand is, you know, help your home. And what's inside of it is your products, which is what you sound to your consumer, right? So the point is, I am now, I, we, after setting up Simply Runway, my customers are the ones who fueled my confidence to continue doing Simply Runway, continue doing retail and sales. People used to call me the bag lady and all kind of thing, right? In the beginning days. I mean, we were selling off the trunk and all kind of thing too in the beginning days. But, you know, when your customers come to you and they, they give you that feedback. And I think it's important that you get this point. You need the information from the customer, which is your community. Find out from them why are they not buying from you and help let that help you grow 
your confidence so that you know it'll be easy for you to pitch your products eventually you, you understand what i mean so i i want to um pull on two words two concepts you talked about passion and confidence all the creatives need to support one another we have our performers wearing an ice hockey t-shirt and, a, and a, a Yankees hat and singing songs like Trinity to the Bone. I think international people are snickering because it, it, it is incongruous for you to be proclaiming your, your, your Trinbegonian status and you're not even supporting one of the designers. You know? And then, and what you support is so far removed even in the texture of the fabric uh, sometimes it's synthetic fabrics that are not suitable for the climate, that have you sweating, not even perspiring. But you are there on stage, and I find that's one of the natural segues. I think our performers should. They have, some have, but a lot of them are not supporting the creatives. The creatives, and I, I like to use creatives, um, when I have my discussions, because they all need to support the performing arts, the graphic arts, animation arts, film arts, have to support, you know, um, the fashion industry, the local fashion industry for us to thrive. For it to be sustainable, it has to be intertwined. And that's how the confidence is built. And the passion is allowed to move into areas where it, it becomes viable. Excellent. Question? Um, not really a question, but a comment on what, what is being said, because um, Candice would have mentioned um, the consciousness and you always any social pressures, because as a designer, we want to have a Caribbean perspective and we are trying to define it. Designers, they know what they are about, eh? most of them. Um, the thing with trying to now sell that to a public that is internationally minded because we have this kind of culture here that you know everything international we want to do everything as american so sometimes when you're thinking you're doing your business proposals your marketing your research and they're saying no we don't want the local because the mindset here in trinidad or even in the caribbean you know is all about outside and i think it, it does speak to our the fact that we have come from that sort of colonial society where we are accustomed to just gravitate into what was the social norm. And that is in itself a, a social pressure on a designer in terms of what they do and what they present to the world and in terms of telling their story. But the thing is, and I always say, you know, you must know what you want for yourself. You must know if you're a designer, if you really want to be a designer, because your will persist. And the thing is, you know, as a designer, you're a business person, you're part of that business fraternity. And part of and you being a part of that business fraternity means that you always must have on that problem solving hat. It is never, the answer is never going to be in front of you always for this year. Next year, you're gonna have a new problem, you're gonna have to have a new solution for this new thing that cropped up. You're gonna have social pressures everywhere. And um, as I was mentioning to the, the, this girl here, if it is that your consciousness is not managed in terms of your positive thinking, your will and your passion, you will crumble in the local community. So to me, test yourself in your local waters. Test yourself why, ask yourself why they don't wanna wear this, what it is they do want. You know what I mean? And see, okay, is it that is, uh, is something within yourself that's preventing you from moving forward? Or is it that, okay, maybe you just don't understand your market? You know what I mean? You need to uh, keep asking yourself these questions and always be in, in problem-solving mode to be able to get by. Otherwise, you will think. Good day, everyone. I'm Avanel Richards. Um, I just have a quick little comment um, that I took note of based on all that was said on the panel so far. Um, I honestly think we have an issue here with national pride. It is grossly lacking. Um, there may be different things, different contributing factors that lend to that being to the extent to which it is a problem. Because if within ourselves we recognize, I mean, if we just have to look around the room, 
and rightly, but even the statistics, the statistics probably be, being even less than the 10% that was suggested. Everybody here is wearing something that was imported, made in America, brought in, etc. cetera. Um, I think that that is where we have to look at putting it from, or should say, to put it to start from a different point. And we always have to utilize the education system, I think, um, impress upon the minds at a much younger stage. We're all here basically set in our ways. We all have decision-making powers and so. So in terms of applying influence, you know, at least put into the younger minds from an earlier stage, the things that we want to see emulated and developed and, you know, grown and continued. So the most I think that we can do, at least um, maybe to help in that way, um, you know, at least reference and the history that was so much brought forward and so on. I know it doesn't solve every aspect of the issue, but it is something that we need to recognize that actually exists and has contributed to the problem that we have. Thank you. Excellent point. Let me just comment on something that came out of that that was playing in my head. We, uh, not just in the garments and, and so on, I, there's a term that I had coined a long time ago and, was, and I had written a whole piece on it. We just make style. The person who is the agriculture person does his agriculture in a style that is suitable to him and the country and everything. So that is what the style is. The style is not just in the clothes. It's in the methodology and the practice of what we do. That we make it become compatible with the space and with the people. So the relationship building, as I say, confronting the reality, creates a new way. And Caribbean people are very, very blessed with the ability to forge their way. They don't have to go only by the standard format. You know, sometimes when I go abroad and I say, oh my God, I'm going to be challenged because I've met this person who is... They only have a format. And they would tell me, well, it can't be done. It would take a year to do it. And I say, well, I can do it in three months because we will apply certain things that will make it practical, you know, and make it happen. You know, because we need to do, as the word would for forge a way. And the celebration is not in only the end product, but it's in the new methodologies. That is part of the process. Because we are very, we just play ourselves. We are very exhibitionistic. Carnival is the expression that we could formulate new ways of style and movement. So we have to accept that gift of being in this space and use it to our advantage because that's what we're not doing yet. Agreed. Um, the gentleman in the denim jacket. Well, Richard Riley, a while back, um, not in this forum here, you had mentioned about um, attacking the global market as a collective. Now, sometimes the, the Caribbean story is not enough. Because we have to understand that we are entering or trying to gain access to some of some markets that are very much protected. And they have door stoppers to keep us out. Right? I remember going to London and a friend of mine's a designer taking me to Somerset House to get into London Fashion Week. And they had door stoppers there, and they're telling me I have to go back to Trinidad and apply on the internet. And so I think we probably, our approach, we should try to develop a Caribbean approach from the perspective of Caribbean people trying to gain entry into, as opposed to, or not to, to sometimes using the, the international approach, which is for people who already in these. these Big markets, they have stoppers to try to keep us out. Because some of these markets, they have like, um, the industry may have fashion universities and they're trying to protect their own. Right? So um, do you still believe that we should approach things from a, a collective point of view in the sense of probably couture, Caribbean, or a, a brand TNT? Well, so it will be Chanel for so brand a, TNT. So that's the same question. Yeah. Okay. This young lady, just like she would want to add something that that same question he's asking. What I want to say is that 
I'm presently researching fashion at the doctorate level. And one of the things, the fault that I always make in presentation when I present, I would look to the international market and try to create the way from what we see there to take over there in terms of bringing it back here and doing it. And one of the things my lecturer keeps saying to me is, if you are just going to do that, just let somebody come from there and let them do it. He said, you will be surprised. Once you understand what is the Caribbean value or the aesthetic, as Mr. Rich Young keeps saying, of the Caribbean, he says, that is something that is coveted by the international market. But it's because we haven't understood what it is. Persons in the market, some may know, but there are a lot of persons who do not understand what is this Caribbean aesthetic. Yes, you might think I designed this. But they don't have an understanding of what it is. If you ask them what success looks like to them, they're going to tell you, when I get, when I see Beyonce wear my dress. No, that's not success, at least not to me. The Caribbean success to me has to be defined by the industry as to what we see this success factor as. Okay, sis. Um, yes, that whole movement of the Caribbeanists, which is sometimes I am bombarded because I'm a Trinidad, 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 and how you talking Caribbean and well, what about us? I am saying privately here, and I say publicly even when I'm in the region, we are ahead of the Caribbean. Per capita, style, value, how we brand, that's a reality. I think they actually know that too. That's why they're calling me to come and help and work. So that has, that has an admission of that. Yes, I think even my own experience I worked in the Caribbean before I moved laterally across to, to Toronto or to uh, New York or to whomever called me over. So I built the brand that this is strong to align with the brands that exist. Because if you go the way of trying to get into their, their thing, we have to come back home as I say and go back to the drawing board. Because the only way in is through the method. Their method. We borrow from their method, just like the ballet. The ballet, we use our fundamentals. But if you can't put your foot by your ears and flex it, it's better you do a good Caribbean dance and scintillate the world. You know, because all the Caribbean, all the cultural buffs and all the anthropologists looking at fashion as a, an extension of culture are fascinated. I met Jean-Paul Gaultier in Martinique. He said, where else would I go for inspiration? I say, inspiration is plagiarism. But he wasn't seeing it so. He is inspired and he's in the market. He's looking at beads and seeds and color and texture to inform his thing. And we are not celebrating our beauty. You know? Uh, 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 I don't want to hog the thing, but there was a time I was at Caribbean Fashion Week and they brought in this woman from Brussels to talk on fashion. And I sat with her for 15 minutes in the corner. And when she went up to talk, she gave me the mic. Of course, the Kingsley Scoopers listened to me because he brought her in to speak. And she said, but you have somebody here who can tell you all what you all have to do. Look outside and look at the shades of the color of the, 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 the topography. Use those colors. Caribbean, Caribbean designers have a gray line. It's okay. And they're saying it's a British gray line. I am not saying that we are to denigrate what they are doing outside there, but we have so much to inform it with. It's so fertile, the references, that we need to align and be an optional brand, an option, optional trademark, an alternative to global style. You're not taking anything away from them. Because the Italians, when I read up on the Italians, the Italian reputation for the in intellectual integrity of what Italian style is. It's critical to being an Italian designer. The French, the Germans, the British, the Japanese, that's what we need to harness, corral, and build, and I'll try to align with. So when they're bringing us over, here is the Caribbean alternative showing in London. Not you trying to get into London, they boot you back out. Here is the Caribbean alternative showing in New York. It has to be that way. And I thought it was a natural thing, so that's what I have been doing. And that's what eased my way in and I'm getting into metropolitan spaces, getting the media to come because they are fascinated with the bombastic, audacious Caribbean people, in a way, saying they have a style. 
When I was in Montreal, we just come back there, all the media came to our press conference. And I was totally shocked. What it is, what is, what is this Caribbean style? Because they only have the formatted way of, as Candice represented, I said just now, the seasons. We are festival communities. We are exhibitionistic. Every little excitement is a style for that. Plus, we have all the, the ethnic um, diversity. Plus, we have island versions of it. It's so multi-layered that we shouldn't be um, limiting on our, ourselves in the expression of our style. And as you see, I'm very, very taken by this. This is what I've been working on for years. And I think it's only now dawning on people. I have speak with some of the lead designers and I hear them using the word Caribbean and I'm proud to hear them say it. But that's not how they spoke before in the 80s when I started. They were categorically against it. So if the designer was categorically against it, the public, the local public can buy it because the designer was trying to align with Armani and hoping in some kind of implicit way that they'll be discovered and be put next to him. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's outrageous. You know? Eight years ago, that was happening when we started because I, when we opened, we saw Richard was there at the opening, mm -hmm. actually the second round, right? About mm -hmm. four years ago. But we started our research about eight years ago. And uh, I started inviting jewelry um, uh, jewelry designers, doing handmade um, jewelry and stuff into the store rent free, right? I just wanted to test the market and see, okay, well, is there a place for this um, currently, right? So, Starting with the jewelry, I started meeting with fashion designers and stuff, and they were just apparently too cool for school. They they didn't see themselves fitting into this retail market at all. They saw themselves beyond where they were. But now, two, let me see, six years after the fact, they understand that we have to start at home and just embrace the richness of the Caribbean. It's right there in front of you, and they're now understanding that. So I'm hoping that that could just continue. <laughs> Uh, yeah. gotcha. Just when you look at fashion history on an international scale, no Italian designer broke into the fashion industry by themselves. Mm -hmm. No American designer broke into the industry by themselves. It was a movement at the time. So fashion, obviously the fashion industry is established in France, and then England came in, the British designers. Then the Italian designers came in in the 80s, and the American designers in the 90s. So even this understanding of America as this fashion force, mm -hmm. it's very, very new. So it, it is about collaboration. It is about a movement that has to happen all together as a time. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. Uh, One second. Eh? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, it's important to, to understand that what every everyone on the panel is saying is extremely, extremely relevant. Because... It is important to present a unified front. It is important to present a level of force that comes with numbers. But when we look to the international market, you need to look at how the international designers service their local markets and how they service their international markets. Never do local um, international designers decide that, you know what, what I'm selling for everywhere I'll sell for here. Or what what's going on here is not important. You have retailers that have adopted the same policy as Simply Runway in regions all over the world. They are, have an affinity to local brands. They want to sell local brands, so much so that they may not be interested in some international brands. But, and they've dropped some, right? But what we need to do when we look at the international industry is not look at it again as a mecca for aesthetic or for reference, or for relevance of creativity. We are some of the most creative people and expressive people in the world. We have more reference than most countries do. But when we look to the international market, we look at the way that they conduct themselves as it relates to business, the way that they conduct themselves as it relates to process, Right? The way that they deal with their local brands, how they interact with their local, sorry, their local markets, and how they treat with external markets. And the relationship between both of them. They look at international markets, of course, as an opportunity to have more, more markets to sell to. But they are 
fiercely loyal to their local market. They show in their local market. They don't show elsewhere. They don't show elsewhere and neglect their local market. They always present their product to their local consumer. And the best pieces are in the local market. You, you look at any of those international brands, what you see in Paris from Balmain is not what you're going to see in New York from Balmain. And that's very, very important. But the process is the most important part of, 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 what, of the takeaway from the international market. Right? And that would even assist you in the way that you treat your local market. Okay. I think we should, we should have time for two more. Yeah. As I, in the Caribbean, I've examined the differences and some of the, the differences I've seen, for example, the economy, the economic influences. Yeah. The educational levels of people there. These factors, the economy, the educational level. When I compare both societies, the issue as well, uh, the issue of poor versus rich. So I'm trying to find out, you know, how these events, well, the, the challenges, the influence of history, for example, in the United States and England, they've brought black people here uh, with slavery. And slavery has had its influence for over, two, for over 200 years. But it's a lack of, of balance, a lack of fairness in terms of the development of the societies. And I think those things are factors that we have to, to consider. And, and somehow we seem not to be ready because of our history. Um, the, the, the progress in the fashion industry is so slow, it seems retarded here. And since 1962, when we had independence, people are still fascinated with what's going on in Europe, um, they, of course, because of their, their educational level, their wealth seems to be superior, and so they've been ignoring what's happening in, in, in Trinidad. They don't have much value for what we have here. So this whole issue of identity has to be changed, and that's very important for Trinidad if we're going to have any success. The changing our, our perceptions, our identities, that whole issue of the story that you all mentioned, I think it really blew my mind, very relevant. What, what the local designers should be focused on is creating a quality product at the best possible price within the price point and you create that and you present that to your local co consumer I bet you they will purchase your product before an international product and that is the bottom line make sure it meets their requirements clothing is not just wearable art it's also fitting a need a basic human need and so when it gets down to it, I want to know that when I spend my money and I invest in this particular product, I'm not just investing in it because it's pretty, but I'm investing in it because it meets my bottom line. Finding that, that delicate balance is where we as local designers or, local, or members of the local um, fashion industry would really, really thrive when we're able to find that balance. Yeah, great. So three more, um, black t-shirt and then pink sweater and then short. Yeah? Okay. Sorry about the name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Ria Grady Noon from Tobago. I'm a designer from Tobago. And from experience, something that really discouraged me is Tobago Fashion Week. I've been dreaming about, about having my line on Tobago Fashion Week since I was a little girl. Yeah. You know, and the opportunity came in 2012. One of the, was one of the best shows ever. I attended, trying to get my name out there, trying to brand. I did everything that they asked me to. And then at the end of the show, you get discouraged. No one follow up on you afterwards, but the year after, they're calling. You're attending. You know, what will you be doing this year, whatever. Right? So after the show, I, I produced my line. I was the only designer there that produced a line to be sold. And afterwards, I myself have to find markets to sell them. So the, I was very discouraged in that aspect, and I wish that it will change in order to encourage us designers to follow through and to produce and to be able to compete with the international market. So Richard, how can we work together in order to encourage designers, you understand, to really go out there, be bold enough 
you know, to produce and be encouraged that there will be a follow-up after, after this. So I was amazed as to nobody called, you know, what are you going to do with the pieces? Is when my customers look forward to me producing a line every year, only they will encourage me to really, you know, go forward. But you guys on top of the head, you need to encourage us below here in order to, to push forward so that we all can be a success in this business. I agree with you. Follow-up has been a, a lacking, um, lacking in these maneuvers and these endeavors when we, when we, we create brands like a fashion week. Um, part of it, again, is the socioeconomic climate um, and the pressures that come with the making of such events. There is a lot of politicking that interferes with the intention of the brand of the fashion week. Um, this allows you from carrying it further. I, I don't want to herald myself, but in the small ways, I have pinpointed designers and carried them and found ways to get them there independently because some of the agencies that we have turned to didn't support the funding of them to move. Because you need to move. If you did a fashion week here, you need to go to another trade show somewhere else, another event. Meet other people of like mind to share the way that you are produced and to find new markets. And we're not e ever able to follow up. And, um, and I am exhausted by me alone getting pulled. But there are some people in the room who would have gotten the opportunity to move into spaces. So I'm, it's real unfortunate that you didn't get that follow-up in that particular um, event. But that is a major problem. Follow-up. Even some of the, the countries I work in, the follow-up, I would write a document, a proposal about follow-up. And then the government now uses it, I realize, again, politics. Um, when the event is done, it heralds them for doing this event, bringing the creatives together. It helps with the next election. And there is no follow-up. And they are, the, 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 the designers are daunted. And in Caribbean societies, with the change of governments, that happens like every fourth thing. The last thing that was committed to is not followed up in the new, um, the new government. And wow. So I have gone through all of them. I mean, elections fell on... The, the, the day of Fashion Week in 2010, and we had to postpone it by a week. And, um, and that was done independent, really, of any support in 2010, and it was the largest, probably, showcase in the region ever. And um, oh, when the new government came in, none of what was promised by the last government came through, and we were in the biggest hole, and that was the end of Fashion Week, Trinidad Tobago, you know? Um, so, yes, I know, follow-up is very difficult, but it doesn't mean that we need to stop trying. We have to constantly find avenues to mount platforms, you know, in spite of that, that shortcoming. Okay, so one thing I just want to share on Trillian and Tobago fashion and the fashion industry. When I started, I looked to learn a lot of the prominent designers so my take is, I wanted to work for a local designer. So I went out there and I pitched after studying garment construction and, and then winning the up and coming fashion designer and I automatically went to Jamaica Fashion Week. And going to Jamaica Fashion Week is when I opened my eyes to a lot of things. And I came back home and I came back home, I started to look at the industry here. But what really hurt me after 2010, 2008, 2009, 2010, they had Trinidad Tobago Fashion Week. Amazing. I spent thousands of dollars to show in Jamaica, islands of the world. And only in islands of the world, I must confess that I got an opportunity to, um, I forget this guy, he was a stylist, and he had my garments, which was the caftan to be selling at, I forget the prominent store, but with Anya Youngchi and Roberto Cavalli and all these people. So coming back home, I realized that we had problem in manufacturing because I wanted more caftans to be made. Couldn't get it done. 
You have to squash that and start over a new direction. But going back to the big, um, trying to be go fashion week, 2008 and 2010, coming into the show, I realized that they were moving. They were moving fashion in Trinidad and Tobago. So recognition is going to happen for us, you know? And one of the things is that when I got the opportunity for Susan Taylor to buy my kaftan because of Trinidad Fashion Week, I only got involved in Trinidad Fashion Week because of Richard Young. He introduced me to Diane Hunt, and Diane Hunt said okay, and I was on board for the show. But the point I come in with is that we have to realize that this is where we live, this is where our culture is, where our lifestyle is. And when we go out to the world, it's, that is what we're going to show. So the thing is, is that I did my history here and I realized I'm not bashing the, any fashion house, but my two fashion houses that stand out if I have to say to represent the Caribbean brand and who I be inspired by would be the cloth and Heather Jones. The other two designers who I admire very much knowledgeable in, in garment construction is Chanel, right? And you wouldn't believe it's the girl who taught me to sew, Grace Duncan. And she refused to be part of the industry because we are not accepting how talented we are. But we need to work together. Because of Richard Young, I saw Canada, Antigua, Bermuda twice. You know, and all the, most of my opportunities came from him only because I created a brand. You know, now after losing everything and I had to start over, I decided just like what um, Jamila and everybody say on top there, you have to look at your market. You have to look at what you, could, you have to sell and make money. And, and I just want to start off by a little vest. And I have customers now traveling all over. And when they travel, they send pictures. One just sent me. This guy I met in Canada, you remember him? Yeah, Kevin Williams. Okay, yeah. yeah. And he bought so far 12 of my jerseys. All live here and went to Canada. And he's vacationing now all over. So you have to look at your market, look at what, as you all said, what is the history? What is the history of your brand? And one thing that I'm, I just have to compliment before I go is three platforms that... I look at and I respect very highly. Fashion TT is one. Because what they do here, they have just changed the whole mechanism of Trinidad and Tobago fashion. It's workable. It's going to be successful. Fashion Focus. A platform to give you recognition and awareness. Right? And I support UTT, CFP. You know, so I, I know that there are a lot of work to be done, but we could do it. We can do it. Just, you know, and you know what I'm proud about? That everybody that spoke here are all local who have done it internationally, been traveling, developed brands. They are examples for us so that we could develop. I am here because I'm weak in certain areas and I'm getting all the knowledge that I want to improve my brand. Hi, um, my name is Akila and currently I am studying at UV. I just finished my first year studying visual art. Now, before this, I had generally no interest in fashion. It is most recent. And I keep hearing uh, tips and ways in which to be successful in the market. But what I want to know is, because each of you have gone into different fields, what I want to know is, what were some of your biggest failures 
your losses, your mistakes, and what have you learned from that and what have you gained? And what are some of the mistakes you have seen other persons make and how do you uh, go from that and grow from that? I'm, I, would, I would start. <laughs> yeah, because that's where, that's where the magic really is. It's in the trying and the feeling, right? And we could all speak to all our talents and all the great things we've done and all of that. Um, I don't glorify my mistakes, but I, I see them, I understand them, and I face them. Um, mistakes that I would have made generally is biting off more than I could chew. Putting confidence in other people and taking away personal responsibility for myself. Trusting people and sharing my ideas at points in time when I shouldn't have and I should have been more vigilant about, um, about managing where my ideas go. And so on and so on. But the biggest mistake that I would have ever made is momentarily for a very, very short period of time. Not taking personal responsibility not making personal responsibility the most important and the North Star and the guiding light of my development as a professional. And when I decided to take personal responsibility, that means responsibility for successes and failures, understanding that outside of myself, there's no entitlement. I'm, not, I'm entitled to nothing. Everything that's given to me is as a facility. But because of my existence, because I am here, and because of my affinity to, to certain things in fashion and in business and in innovation, it means that I already have the tools. The desire is the seed for anything else that I need. That consciousness that we were talking about on the stage, that, that understanding that you have the ability to do it, that understanding that creativity is one of the highest forms of intelligence, so as somebody who creates, you are tapping into a level of intelligence that is not always easily articulated. We may be able to articulate it here from time to time, but there are things that you can't even articulate. But taking personal responsibility for my successes and taking personal responsibility for my shortcomings and understanding that even though I'm a part of a collective, more importantly, I'm a singular entity. And that's what I think all of us in the fashion industry have to understand, we need to understand that. We need to understand that while we are having facilities extended to us by government, government is not the main investor in the fashion industry, the stakeholders are. Government facilitates, and we should accept these facilities, be grateful for them, utilize them, but not expect them to be the way forward. There's no one avenue, there's no one project, there's no one opportunity that's going to take your brand forward. There's no one thing. There's always a continuous opportunity. It's never finished. It's never done. This is not it. There's always something else. As you grow and as you develop, as we take the Caribbean aesthetic forward, there will be a new challenge for us to face. We haven't even dealt with the issue of technology and innovation and where we are in that. We're still working out manufacturing and entering into markets. So there's always an opportunity, but taking personal responsibility for your development, for your successes and for your failures is really the way forward. <laughs> um, mine, what led to my biggest failure to date has been not listening <laughs> to advice that is given. And I want to, because you asked what was our biggest failure and what are the issues that you see coming up, and I see that issue come up with young designers all the time. Um, in my personal experience, I've been doing my business since in Trinidad since 2011. I, I'm, a, I'm a chemist. That's my actual title. Um, I'm a chemist and I um, used to formulate cosmetics in the States and I was always very interested in the luxury field. Even now, luxury is my area. I'm fascinated by it. And I came home and I had this idea. I was going to start this luxury cosmetic line. Did not work. And so about two years after the first, um, uh, the first launch, I was, I'm just like rolling in a ball on the floor crying, like that level of fear. I could not even look at my ingredients. I could not look at my, my, my lab. It was that level. And I decided I was going to go away to study luxury and hopefully at some point in time be able to work in that area internationally. 
And what I learned over that year studying my luxury, I have a, a, a degree in luxury brand management, is tools and techniques that I could take from that level and apply them to my business while still maintaining a price point that people could afford. And nothing has been as successful as that since then. And so why I want to say that I see that as a problem for others too is that I see designers particularly wanting to be in their design head all the time. All the time it's all about they want to show how many, how many skills and what their level of craftsmanship they have and they forget what do people actually want to wear. Even on international level runways, you see the show on TV, you see show on the internet. And when you go into the store, those pieces have been distilled down into things that people actually can wear in their day-to-day -day lifestyle. And I feel like Caribbean designers many times want the showmanship to show through at all times and don't want to give up anything in order to make the sale. And um, a lot of that can happen from not the same, not listening, not listening to cust potential customers and not listening to other people in the business. So that's mine. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start <laughs> <laughs> talk because, like I said earlier, my background is actually in environmental and natural resource management. I did another degree in geography, which is totally unrelated to fashion as well as business. So basically, Simply Runway is a collection of failures, I would say, Try, it has been trial and error. I have no formal education in business. It has been research and testing, research and testing all the time. So within that research and testing process, obviously you're going to have the failures, which are the drop-offs. But what I would say is I knew that I didn't want to work for anybody, and I knew that I wanted to have Simply Runway stand for something more than just retail. I wanted, I knew I wanted my customers, which originally started as my friends and family, and to know that it was an investment into a company um, that was basically me at first. Your company is really you at first, and that grew by extension to taking care of my customers, right? So it was just trial and error, trial and error, and... Uh, Basically, just a group of failures that I just kind of plummeted through and just kept working and worked with what worked and left what left and just persisted. It, it was I really just had to be persistent and knowing what I wanted for myself and not letting anything basically stop me. And by anything, I would say our biggest stumbling block was when our store basically was below Ruby Tuesdays and Ruby Tuesdays burnt down and my store was below. And we got totally flooded and smoked out, and about $350,000 in merchandise was ruined. This was during Christmas. So thankfully, though, six months before, about four months before, four to six months before, we had opened a bigger branch within Grand Bazaar, the same mall. And in about two or three weeks, we had to figure out, okay, um, how we were going to recover from these losses and what was going to happen to the store because you know it's a new location we had opened so nobody even knew about where when where we have relocated or you know really was aware of the changes because we just kind of moved into that space pretty quickly and people were accustomed to this space that was now basically burnt as well and we had to just jump into action and figure out okay how are we going to recover from this so of course my husband being Bob the Builder he just, you know, it was like, just to study it, don't worry about it. All our stock that we had imported had not gotten into the store that burnt us yet. So we were able to move that stock into the new space and just kind of condemned everything in our old space. And we were able to make more money in that one location than if we were operating separately. And do you know that could really happen as if you just stuck with it regardless of what you are facing you know what you want that's why you know true passion when you just can't give it up you just know this is what you have to do and you're totally blinded by wanting this goal for yourself and we just constantly were embracing the failures failures in every form poor purchase prices poor look uh, poor, sorry poor purchase and prices poor location uh, poor branding poor everything you know it's only now after eight years i would say okay 
we probably in a better <laughs> position than then having a bigger store, having more staff, uh, being able to purchase locally now. You know, we've, we've grown a lot and I would say it's because of our failures. All the trials and the growth that you get from going through everything and everyone's failures will be different, obviously. You know, it just depends on your field and what you're looking at, you know. So, it's just to, to me, I embrace the haters. And I embrace the problems because that's when it can grow, you know. That's when you know, okay, what the issue is and what we have to do and how we solve in that. And your goal is always there, so you just keep persisting. So. Okay. Similarly, um, to Candice, um, my failures were many. And I was very um, candid in accepting them over the years. I started in the 80s, so I'm 100 years. <laughs> and um, I didn't, I second-guessed myself even though the thing was being thrown at me. I was at university studying literature, French, history, learning to be more articulate like a nobleman of the 18th century. And uh, my mother asked me to do this show, and it was done by the university, the entire university body. And Banyan covered it, and it threw me because of my articulateness on television. I became a brand. 1986, through that year, Richard Young did this huge fashion show and brought 80 designers together with 80 models at the JFK Lecture Theater. Everybody who was, everybody was there. So I was a little bombastic after that, and, but always second-guessing myself. So there were some shows that didn't work because I thought it would happen as naturally as that. So what I have learned from the process over the years is that you have to be multifaceted. So now I do proposal pitches. So like I work in Antigua, it's because I have pitched to the Ministry of Culture about how to develop the fashion and beauty arts over three-year periods, and I've been working there so often, St. Lucia Tourist Board, and I did hot couture, all of them, you, I had to use intelligence to find, to forge a way forward, to live off of this sideline thing. But I'm constant, I had been constantly not believing myself, and I would admit to people that only in the last two or three years, and people say, you have to be talking craziness, because you would have been seeing talented Richard Young, so and so, and I used to be like, what the hell are they writing that for? What is my talent? I can't do anything, but in the last few years, and it's just about two or three years, I said it is a talent. It is a talent to corral these designers together. It is a talent to direct them, to just hear on a spot what they're doing and tell them, you know what, let's brand it this way and help them develop the brand value of a particular space in their, in their life to move forward for their collections and so on. So then I realized that the literature and all that thing I was studying was for this fortifying of people's brands and to help them see what they need to see, you know? And, it, and, and, and that's why you always hear me referencing historical because that's what I did. I did a lot of history, I did sociology, and I believe in the networking of people. I believe in the institutional strengthening. I believe in the collective and all of that is what I do as a result of having to find a way to continue because this has become my livelihood. You know, it's no longer what I do on the side. I used to work in telco. Tell you how old I am. <laughs> you know, telco, I used to work doing mundane tasks that, I mean, didn't probe my intelligent side at all. And um, so the success, I would say, for people is to have the passion and go after it, but consolidate your interests, strengthen your weak points, because there are weak points you pick up on your, you identify, like sometime I would do a show and the audience is clapping and Queens Hall in the days we used to do filled, which means it's a success. And I'm home two weeks in the depression because it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And then people said, if everybody in the audience is clapping that they like it, Shut your mouth, get out, and just improve on what you thought was wrong for the next one. So I came out of that now. So I'm no longer down when it doesn't work out as well as I want it to work out. So that is what you need to do for yourself, emotionally, um, to keep going. And passion is the ingredient 
that you have to allow um, to move you forward. Strengthening with, with, with um, academia, strengthening with practice, strengthening with networking, but it is the passion that will keep you going. In the creative industry, that's what it has to be. Because without the passion, you can't keep forging. Yeah. So I think that brings a nice end to what we've discussed this morning. I hope that the questions, the answers, the comments will enrich in. I know that you all probably have um, an agenda to continue with. So at this point in time, I'd like to thank you for being a fantastic audience and hope that we can really take this fashion industry to where it needs to be. <laughs>